Okay. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to um, our study in the epistle of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue in this, uh, this uh, series that we've been looking at called the Self-Sacrificial Ministry. Uh, this will be our last <clears throat> night in this section. So uh, let me pray and, and then we'll go ahead and, and get started with our lesson for this evening. This one is going to be a little shorter than some of the others, okay? Father God, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we come this evening first and foremost to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for another day's journey, for watching over us and keeping us, God, through dangers seen and unseen, for waking us up this morning and carrying us throughout this day and bringing us to this very hour and this time that we might come together, Lord God, to study your word, to show ourselves approved. Now open up our spiritual ears, O Lord, and our spiritual ears and, and speak to our hearts, Lord God, minister to us as we come tonight uh, to <clears throat> to once again lift up the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Now, uh, fill us afresh with your spirit. Give us what we need, Lord. Help us to be more than hearers, but doers of your word. And then order our steps, God, and direct our path and lead us in the path that you would have us to go, that everything we do, Lord God, and everything we say might honor and glorify you. Now, bless these, your students of the Bible. And give us what we stand in need of, Lord, that we might comprehend clearly uh, what you're saying to us. And then in all of these things that we will rejoice as we do all that you've gifted us to do and given us to do and blessed us to do. These things, oh God, we do ask and pray tonight. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen. All right. Once again, we come to this uh, study in 2 Corinthians. And so tonight our topic is going to be ministry through giving. These last three lessons that we've been, <clears throat> that we've gone through have talked about giving. And tonight <clears throat> we're going to complete chapter nine as we talk about ministry through giving. I kind of thought about that a little bit and said, okay, Lord, what, what are you saying? What do I need to understand at, at, about the topic? Even before we get into the meat of what you're going to tell us, what do I need to understand about this topic? A, and so ministry through giving is the intentional and generous use of our financial resources <clears throat> and our time and our talent and what other, and um, what any other assets that God might give us to serve and support the needs of others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so it's all about our sacrificial serving of other people in the name of the Lord. And so tonight, as we go through our lesson, we want to remember that that's what it actually means when we talk about this thing called ministry through giving. I'm serving God through how I give to whatever God has called me to give to, in his name that might advance the kingdom, edify his people and move his church forward. And so that's what we're talking about tonight when we look at this topic, ministry through giving. And as always, I, I start here because I think this here is where we need to really make sure that we've honed in onto what God is saying to us as we come to our preaching and our teaching moments and as we come to our Bible study and our Bible reading and our memory of verses. These are the kinds of things that, that, that this continued study, this theme, the letters revolve around the theological concepts and the practical application, as the practical aspects of our Christian living. And so we need to really remember that in everything that we do. And I'm sure it's been, you know, we put it in so much that you have not forgotten. And so the primary issue that we're dealing with again in Corinth was the church's recognition of what a, what a, a uh, authentic ministry really looked like. They lived in a place where many religions existed side by side. So they had a plethora of these synchronistic systems moving around what was going on in the church and in the community that had them looking and trying to decide what's real and what's not real. And, and, and so the recognition of, of, author of authentic ministry Give me back my tongue, Lord. And submission to the apostolic authority that God had placed 
in their midst. Those are some challenges that we still face today. Well, what is authentic ministry? What does that really look like? And, and who are these apostolic uh, uh, ministers or what is this authority that we've been placed under? And so as Paul is dealing with those kind of things, his corrective is, as always, to provide guidance and encouragement as the church navigates the challenges that they're facing that continue to influence their unity, their discipline, and their spiritual growth. And if you look around the church today in, in the 21st century America, you can see that we're still struggling with unity. We're still struggling with discipline. We're still struggling uh, with our own spiritual growth, as well as the spiritual growth of those that God has called us to minister to. So we're still struggling in the church, just as they were in the first century, in the 21st century. And so in our study tonight, Paul addresses the issue of charity and generosity among believers. What does that look like? He encourages the Corinthians to be generous and he assures them of God's provision. <clears throat> and he highlights the spiritual benefits of their generosity, both for the recipients of their charity and for themselves as a community of believers. Uh, so so what, what this says to us is Paul is going to help us understand that our generosity and our charity toward others is not just something that blesses and benefits them, but it also blesses and benefits us as believers in the community of faith and as givers of what God has placed into our hands. And so we're going to see a little bit about that. And so once again, we're going to be looking at ministry through giving. We're going to be in chapter 12, the end of, I mean, chapter nine, the end of chapter nine, verses seven through 15. I, I like the way Swindoll opens this lesson because he had me to go back and really listen and take a look at, uh, at this parable that he gives us. Swindoll opens by reminding us of the parable Jesus told in Luke 7. Uh, verses 36 through 47. And we're not going to read that because it's pretty long. Uh, uh, about the woman who washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair and kissed and anointed them with the fragrant oil from an alabaster box. And we, we've got a song talking about the woman with the alabaster box. And, and so this parable was meant to frame a simple situation. Here's what it is. Two people owe the same creditor but one owes a significant amount of money and the other one only a small amount of money. And, and so if the creditor forgives both debts, which person would be more thankful? What do you think? If, if I owe a lot and, and you owe a little and, and we're both being forgiven, which one of us would be more grateful, be more thankful, be more uh, in, inclined to, to, to do something for someone else simply because of what's been done for me. Think about that. And so the point Jesus makes is that a great amount of forgiveness, the grace he had shown to this woman, results in a great outpouring of love. The response that the woman showed toward Jesus. She, 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 he had given her, forgiven her, and that forgiveness abounded in her that what she did was poured out her love for him based on just what he had done for her. And so the point is that the joy of being forgiven is one that results in a life full of grace toward others. And I know we don't always think about that. We don't always think about how what God has done in forgiving us or providing for us how that makes a difference in how we handle and deal with other people in our sphere, especially in the body of Christ. We, we come in on our Sunday morning services or, or, or our Wednesday nights or whatever it might be. We, we do our thing, we get our blessing and we go home. Many of us don't even speak to anybody else until the next time we come together. We don't think about each other. We, we don't try to see what's going on in each other's lives. And so one of the things that I'm wanting and praying that this lesson will help us to do is to see deeper, not just into what someone else has got, but what God has done to me and how that has moved me to action in the lives of other people. How has what God has done for you, think about this, moved you to act based on what God has done for you. Not what somebody else did for you. 
not what you got from them, not what the sermon said, not what the Bible study said, but just because of what God has done for you. How, how has that moved you to engage differently in the lives of other people? That, that's what Paul is, is trying to help us understand as he's encouraging these Corinthians to get involved in the issues that are going on in the church that's outside of Corinth. This has nothing to do with what's going on in your church. This has everything to do with what's going on in the body of Christ. How's, how's the church doing in, 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 in Jerusalem? How's the church doing in, in, in Dale City? How is the church doing in Richmond? How's the church doing in D.C.? How's the church doing? And what responsibility, come on somebody, do I have for helping them through? Not just the missionaries and what, what they do, but what about the individual members who name the name of Christ and what we do? And what we do. And, and so that's the principle. And so this principle of acting in response to God's grace with an outpouring of love is one that guides Christian conduct in every area of our lives. That's what I was just saying. It, it should, we should, come on somebody, based on what we have learned about giving, we should be examining our giving, not just to the church, but to the other kinds of things that God is doing in the world. Hello, somebody. God is at work, not just in our Sunday morning worship services or our ministry programs, but in the lives of individuals who belong to him. Everybody's not in the church. I, I know they ought to be. Everybody's a part of the church. Everybody might not come to the church. And there's some people who can't even get there. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we respond in love to what God has done for me. That, that's the whole example of, of, of this parable that, 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 that uh, Jesus told to Simon the Pharisee uh, uh, about the woman uh, with the alabaster box. That, that's, that's the whole premise. And so, and so a mindful response to what the Lord has done for us results in a gracious and willing attitude to help those around us especially fellow believers. That's, that's what we're talking about. How, how do we engage meaningfully in what God is doing? Notice I didn't say in the body of Christ. We're in the body of Christ because we belong to Jesus. But in what God is doing, how do we engage mindfully in that? That will make a difference in the lives of other people. And so, and, and so it should not surprise us that this principle of God's overflowing grace underlies Paul's thinking when he speaks to the Corinthians about their giving. That's what's in his mind. How do you, based on what God, remember what they said about the church at Corinth. Corinth had it going on. They had the gifts working. They had money. They had members joining. They had ministries moving. They, they had it going on. God was blessing them in spite of them. Come on, somebody. And that's what we have to remember. God is in the blessing business. Not, not just because, uh, uh, not, not because of what you're just, all the little things that are going on, but because you belong to him. And because you've been faithful in your belief and your actions toward him. And so the Corinthian church, Paul had been there and spent some time there for, to, to, to minister to them. They had it going on. And so what Paul wants them to understand is just because you have it going on doesn't mean that everything is what it ought to be everywhere else. And so he's trying in all that he does to encourage them to move away from their from the issues and the problems that are keeping them from looking clearly at what God has done and to get involved in what's going on in the world that God owns. That's, that's what he wants us to do. And so in these verses, Paul deals with the application of giving. The app, how, how do we do this? 
What do we do? How do we make that work of giving by describing the manner in which we are to give? And so the verses that we're going to look at tonight will help us to understand a little bit more about how we apply this ministry through giving saying in effect that we need to put into action the principles characterized by others' examples and in response to God's abundant blessing. And I, and I like that because what it says is not only do, do, do we need to do what we need to do <clears throat> because of God's abundant blessing, <clears throat> but we ought to take some examples from what other folks are doing or how other folks are doing it. We're not in this thing all alone. We're in a community of faith. And because we're in a community of faith, we have examples that we can draw from to help us understand application of, not, 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 not what we do specifically, but how to apply the word of God to our own ministries and to our own lives as we walk out this thing called the Christian life. That, that, that's, that's what that specifically says. Is, is that, we, that we take these principles that are characterized by others' examples and in response to what God has done, his abundant blessing toward us. So tonight, that's what we plan to do. In, in other words, the one who claims to live obediently by faith in God does not ignore these ascent, this essential area of ministry. Giving is one of the areas of ministry. And, and, when, and when we are obedient to the faith, then, then this is a ministry that becomes a part of who we are and how we walk out our lives for Christ, the ministry of giving. And I know we don't always talk about giving this way. But, but what we want to, to have is, is an understanding of what scripture is telling us about giving, as well as examples of how and what and where we've seen it worked out in the lives of other people. You watch God bless some folks, some of you, your parents and, and, and your children and, and, and your jobs and your homes and you, all of that we've been watching God do for years. What is our response? And what is our responsibility? And so as a response to what God has done for us, we are encouraged to pass on God's grace to others in tangible ways. Pass on God's grace as we bountifully and cheerfully give back to God. What does that mean? As we, the body of Christ, give, all of our giving is in response to who God is. And, and God said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. We talked a little bit about that in noonday today. And, and, and so, so when we come giving, bountifully means that we're giving in abundance. And cheerfully means is that we're giving it with an attitude of, of thanksgiving. We're giving it with an attitude of, 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 of praise. We're giving it with an attitude of humility. And every time we give, we give back to God, no matter who we're giving it to, because God is the one who's giving it to us. And so tonight, we're going to start in verse 7, and, and we're going to take, take this verse and, and kind of move it forward into what it really says to us. So in verse 7 of chapter 9, Paul says, so let each one give as he purposed in his heart. Look what he says, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We quote that all the time. That, that's one of our go-to scriptures. That's one of our mantras when it comes to uh, God giving to us. God loves a cheerful giver. But if we purpose in our heart, then, 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 and, and, and in our heart, and we give not grudgingly, God loves a cheerful giver. We, we use that a lot, okay? And so in verse six, before we get here, Paul draws upon an architectural metaphor to illustrate the spiritual truth that sparingly sowing leads to scanty harvest. Generous sowing, however, leads to an abundant harvest. 
that that that's the principle that's the spiritual principle that Paul is hanging the rest of this on <clears throat> when you look at it in, in verse 7 know what it says it, it does say just that verse 6 says that <clears throat> that when we sow that if we sow sparingly that that we'll reap sparingly <clears throat> my voice is is going through so help me <laughs> work with me here on this he says remember this the water you, there's some water some I've got some water. There. I've got some water. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. That's what he says. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And so everything now springs upon uh, what he said there. And so in verse 7, he comes back to help us understand. So he takes this general principle and he makes it personal. To every individual, I, I, I like the way he does this. He he makes it personal to you and me <clears throat> with no exceptions. Here Paul says, each one, verse seven says this. It says, you must each decide. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. This is the New Living Translation. And then it says, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. And so from, from verse six to verse seven, Paul takes the spiritual truth about sowing and reaping and he individualizes and he personalizes it to say to us that each one of you, not, 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 not the whole group, everybody individually has to make some decisions. There are no exceptions. Everybody must be involved. And, and this is what we have to remember. Everybody must be involved in financial stewardship and contributing to the ministries in some way. N none of us who belong to Christ should say that we can't give. God never asked all of us to give the same thing. And, and so what Paul is saying here in this verse, in this seventh verse, is that you must each decide in your hearts how much to give. Didn't say based on some formula. Didn't say based on some pledge. Didn't say based on some, 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 some need. But based on how you in your heart decide to give. That's an important, that's an important thing for us to remember as we plan our giving. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Questions or comments? I, I know this is a deep subject and, and many times it's very challenging for us. Questions or comments? Just a, a statement that uh, it's not that we give the same amount, we give the same percentage, which is a tithe, the 10%. But that's going to be a di different amount. It's going to be a different amount. And, and, and what, what, the, what it says here, it doesn't say percentage. It says how much you're going to get. Okay. So, so your, your amount is not going to be the same as my amount. And, and, and someone else's amount might not be the same as your amount. Okay. Everybody must be involved. That's the other thing that we need to remember. All of us as Christians should be, must be, involved in financially supporting the ministry of Jesus Christ. All of us, all of us. And that's what Paul is, is saying to the Corinthian church and to us today. <laughs> okay, I guess that ain't what I want. And so this given must also be intentional. What does that mean? Not haphazard. The, the Greek term here for intentional means what? Who 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 wants to talk about intentional? Intentional is is it, got to be what? What does that mean? It means it has to be deliberate. Something Purpose. that we plan. Go yeah, ahead. Purposeful. Purposeful. Something that we plan. N not just something that that we've decided to do in the spare of the moment. 
but but because we're doing it based on how God has blessed us and based on who God is in our lives and based on what God has said about funding his economy, th then it must be something that is deliberate, something that we planned, uh, 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 something that is, is done on purpose and it's deliberate, it's performed with intention and forethought. That, that's what he's saying. It, it can't be haphazard, random, or, or just pulled out of the sky, lacking any principles or organization, Did something that's disorganized. We, that's something that Paul is saying. Don't do it haphazardly. Don't do it haphazardly. And, and don't give reluctantly. That's reluctantly. Or in response to pressure. And so as we come to this particular uh, uh, subject and this issue, we've got some instructions here for how we ought to be doing it and how we should not be doing it. This Greek word for purpose means to choose beforehand or to decide ahead of time how, how we're going to get it. That, that is what Paul is teaching us from scripture uh, that 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 if when we come to the table, when we come to this thing called giving, then we should already have purpose or, or, or planned in our heart or been intentional in our heart about our giving. Questions? Comments? Okay. And, and so the believer's financial planning should originate not from external pressure, but from the heart. Our financial planning should originate from our hearts. Not because there's something that somebody wants you to give to, not because we, we have some campaign going on, but because God has spoken to your heart and to your spirit and, and he's, he's shown you how and what to do. We, we never have to come to this thing alone without the guidance of the spirit of the Lord when we'll listen. God will send us the information we need. Questions or comments? And so gracious giving results from heartfelt resolve. We, 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 we have a plan now. If, if it doesn't spring from the heart, it is given grudgingly or under compulsion. Giving is always a heart issue. It's about an intentional, planned, deliberate desire to bring back to the Lord what he's placed in your heart to give. Questions? But when giving comes from a heart full of grace, full of cheer, it will not only feel rewarding for the giver, but it will also inspire others with the joy of giving. Think about that. When, you're, when you give cheerfully and when it comes from your heart, it, it, it not only, you're not only rewarded for your giving, but others are inspired by your giving. Others are inspired. And, and then they themselves can tap into that same joy for giving. When you give cheerfully, when you give from the heart, uh, it, it abounds to other people. Uh, where were we talking about this? David, David West was talking about sitting in his car on Sunday, just laughing. And he looked over at somebody and that person looked at him and his laughter generated laughter in someone else who may not have even known what he was like, who probably didn't know what he was laughing for. It's that same kind of reciprocity when it comes to cheerful giving and, and how that is so rewarding to us and how it can inspire others to be joyful about giving. That's that same kind of analogy works when we talk about hilarity in our giving or hilarious giving. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Questions or comments? Look at what Paul says at the end of this verse. Look what he says. He says, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Now think about that. Think, think about a cheerful giver. I, I, and this is a great statement, Brother Simon. Given is often, listen to this, influenced by our level of trust that God will provide for our needs and essentially what we value. I, I, I totally agree that given is influenced by our level of trust in God. If you don't think you can trust God, uh, you're going to find it difficult to want to give to him. But when, but when we believe and trust that God will provide, remember what scripture says. Scripture says, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in glory in his son, Christ Jesus. When we believe that, when we believe that, then we find it easy to be cheerful about our giving. We find it easier to plan what we're going to do and to give unto the Lord. And so the first place, and thank you, Brother Simon, the first place that we start with, and we've st we looked at that in some of the other lessons, these previous three lessons, is that we have to be willing to give out of a heart that already trusts that we can, we can depend on God to provide for us. We can depend on God. If, if I can depend on you, God, I have no problem with giving to any cause for any reason in any way. If you tap me on my shoulder and say, I want you to give over here and here's what I want you to give. And you've done that, Lord. And I had to say, are you sure? And, and you say, yes, I'm sure. And, and I wrote the check, okay? And guess what? The next week, I got the money back. Unexpectedly. But God just sometimes wants to see what you're going to do. I want to see what you're going to do. Look what Paul says again. For God loves a cheerful giver. And, and so this Greek word for cheerful is hilarious. Our word for hilarious which means funny. God loves us to have a, a, a spirit of, 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 of laughter in our giving. This doesn't mean that God loves a ridiculous giver or a funny giver or a giver who does not take giving seriously. It doesn't mean that at all. It does. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that God desires our giving to generate the same exuberant joy in our hearts as a lively celebration or a hearty laugh. What God wants us to do, and, and I think I said this in one of the other lessons, is that I went to um, the Presbyterian Ebenezer Church up on um, Miniville Road, no, Telegraph Road, and, and I was there for their worship service. And when it came time to giving, to give, they danced all through the place. They danced, they, they, they started this exuberant music and, and they started dancing up to the place where they would give the music and they had their offerings in their hands and, and they were swirling them around and dancing and singing and laughing. And they were doing so it with such joy and such exuberance that, you know, you, you catch it. It, you get, it gets into who you are and what you're doing if you're there to worship. So they had this ministry of giving that was jubilant and, and hearty and celebratory as they gave unto the Lord. That's the kind of giving that God would have us to do, have us to have. So, 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 so here's the thing. If you can't give with a smile, then you're not giving from your heart. If, if you can't give with a smile, then you're not really giving from your heart. Something else may be motivating your giving, but it ought to be that you have purposed in your heart that I'm going to give. And I'm going to give this to the Lord. And so Swindoll says, Swindoll says, when I look at how giving has been treated in the church today, I feel most of us have been ripped off. 
And as I think about it and I look at the different places that I've been and how I've observed how we give and, and what that looks like and, and how people do it, yeah, we probably have. We probably have. And, and so many churches have taken the joy out of giving. They prescribe certain percentages or pushed hard for certain amounts that it sounds more like the drudgery of the law than the joy of grace. When, when, when our giving becomes the sole purpose of, of what's going on in the ministry, when everything is about giving, when everything is about money, Th th then the drudgery is back to the law that prescribes how we live our lives. You do, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. Instead of allowing grace to move us to a place of humility where we're listening to the spirit and we're moving based on who God is in our lives and what God has done in, in our finances and in blessing us. Not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of grace that helps us to know that God is yet in the midst of everything we're doing. And, and so according to Paul, giving should be fun. According to the scripture, giving should be fun. Uh, but it's not fun to be handed a bill and asked to write a check. Hard sales aren't fun. Neither is it fun uh, giving to meet some arbitrary goal that, that none of us understand or, or, or even thought we had. Those are, those are not times when giving becomes fun and hilarious and, and, and cheerful. However, giving in response to God's grace given to others out of love and joy, and given to a ministry vision we believe in is fun. That's cheerful giving. That's cheerful giving. Cheerful giving is when we can come to the table based on how God has blessed us, respond to his grace in a way that not only gives us an opportunity to, to celebrate what God has done, but, but it also helps us to be a part of the ministry vision that God has placed us in. It helps us to give because we love and because out of our love, we're willing and wanting to give. That's, that's what it's all about. That's who we should be in the church. That's how we should be in the church. I can, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes we have to, you know, talk about being, being churched. I can remember when you, that was just, everything was going on in the church and you just wanted to be there. You just wanted to be there. Uh, uh, you, you, for every rehearsal, for every Bible study, you just wanted to be there. We don't have as much of that as we used to. We're trying to bring people back after COVID. But, but even before COVID, we, we still were struggling with our coming together. And, and so that's grace giving. Grace giving is, is given based on how God has blessed you, the grace of God in your life. It, generously, without prescription, voluntary, without compulsion. That's grace giving. Grace giving says, I, I, I don't need anybody to prescribe how I do this. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need rules and regulations and laws and, 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 and those kind of things, nor do I have to be compelled or pushed to do it. I do it because I love the Lord and because of how he has blessed me. And I give based on his blessings in my life. And if we look at that, for the most part, for most of us, it exceeds the tithe. God has blessed us so that that 20, 25 percent of our income, uh, we're saving much of it. And, and some of it uh, we're just spending to 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 meet our own needs and to fulfill our own desires. And, and, and if we really step back from it, we can see that, that God has blessed us to the point that we can give far beyond the time if we purposed it in our hearts, in our hearts. And, and so Paul goes on in verses eight through 11, and he continues with, with this, with this um, 
ministry of giving. And he says, and God. Now, now remember, God is already in verse seven. We've already talked about that 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 God has that that we have to purpose in our heart uh, to to give, and that God loves a cheerful giver. And, and, and purpose in our heart to give and, and knowing that God loves a cheerful giver, Paul comes back and says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things. Listen to that. Now, God is able. We, we know that for, for a matter of fact, he had already told us back in verse seven. So, so let each one of you give as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And, and then, and then he comes back and said, and, and oh, by the way, as you purposed in your heart, here's what I want you to understand. When you give, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, not someone else, always have an all sufficiency in all things. Notice how many alls always have an all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance of every good work for every good work so what does that mean that that means that 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 god is able to provide for you what you need it, the more you give the more god gives to you the more you 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 uh, trust god the the more god can get into and come into your life so all grace abounds to you so that you will always have everything that you need, all sufficiency and all things that you, and then after all you have, he says that you may have an abundance that you, what you have, God has given you. And now he's given you even more so that you can participate in every good work that he's brought before you to participate in. And then it says, as it is written, he has dispensed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever because of what you've done. You've given to the poor. You've dispensed what God has given to you all abroad. You, you've gone and, and supported these ministries. And, and, and so righteousness endures, but God's righteousness in you endures forever because he sees you working through what he's given you to bless others based on how he's blessed you. It says, now may he who supplies seed to the sore and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. You, you, you hear that? God who supplies seed to the sower, and, and, and not only does he supply the seed, he also gives the bread that comes for food. He supplies and multiplies the seed you sown and increases the fruit of your righteousness. And while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. And so as people partake of what God has given you to give to them, guess who gets, guess who gets thanked? Guess who comes and, and, and God is acknowledged because of your gift to someone else. Thank God for what he's done. It came from you, but God is the source of the supply. That's what we have to remember, questions or comments. And so Paul now moves from the foc moves the focus from the immediate giver to the ultimate giver. That's what we were just talking about. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean? That, what is the immediate giver? Or who is the immediate giver? Who is the ultimate giver? The, the immediate giver is you and me. It, it, it is the individual that directly donates the money, the goods, or the service. The ultimate giver is the original source of the funds or the resources that are eventually donated. And, and so when we look at this, what Paul now does, as it gets to verse 8 and through 11, he moves from the individual, you and me, God loves a cheerful giver and how we do that and, and what that all means, to, to now dealing with the ultimate giver, who is God. So we give what God gives us, but he's the source of everything we give. That, that's what Paul wants us to understand. And, and, and so we give liberally without worry because God will make his grace abound to us so that we will always have enough. And 
But we got to trust that God will do that. Brother Simon said, part of our problem is, is a trust issue. It's a heart issue. It's a trust issue. Can I trust you, God, to do what you promised you would do? But remember what he said in Malachi, try me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. And so, and, and so until you try him, you, you really won't have a, a good understanding of his faithfulness. And let me say this, I, I've tried him, not just with my finances, but with my health. Not just with my health, but, but, but with my happiness. With, with, with my home and with my children. And I'm convinced that God will do just what he said he's going to do. He's never failed on any level. And I haven't always known how everything's going to work out. And sometimes it takes a little bit more to let go and to trust than it does at other times. You know, when I when I when I can see where it's coming from, you know, you know, I I I I can say okay. But when I can't see where it's coming from, when I don't know what's going to happen when the doctor comes back in the room, when I don't know what the test results are going to be, when I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill, when I don't know those things, that's when my trust level has to come into play. You know, some of us have so much that we don't even have to worry and think about whether God's going to provide because because we got it in the bank. We can just do it ourselves. But, but what we have to remember is that God's grace has a bound to us to put us in a place where we're in that situation. Everything we got has come from God. Remember, we can never outgive God, no matter how hard we try. God will never appear one day and say to us, well, uh, you tapped me dry. I I'm out. There's nothing else left. I, I can't meet that need because the bank is empty. We'll never have to worry about God saying that. That might be you and I. That might be might be the treasury at church. We, we can't do that because we don't have money. But that's not God. God will always provide for your need. If he sends you to it, come on, somebody. He'll take you through it. And so as often as we dispense our resources in generous giving, God will replenish them and refresh us with divine grace. His principle of liberal provision will always create confidence in us as givers. What, what, is, what does that mean? What, what is his principle of liberal provision? When you think about God's provision, how, how, does, that, how does that come to you? That, that God has a principle of liberal provision. So, so God's, God's, God's principle of liberal provisions, it, provision is the abundant and generous way in which God supplies all that we need for our lives, for our well-being, for our spiritual growth. And, and, and that's what that is. His provision extends to spiritual blessings and guidance and comfort and support and all of those things. In, <clears throat> it includes the idea of God's grace and his mercy and his love that he provides toward us to meet our basic needs. That's, that's his liberal provision. He, he, he's, not, he's not looking around and, and, and liberally means that he gives abundantly to us. We, we get from him abundantly. That's his generosity toward us. That's his liberal provisions. They will always create confidence in us as, believe, as givers when we tap into what God is doing and we realize that everything we have comes from God. Remember one of the lessons we said it all belongs to God. <clears throat> and so now here in, in, in verse um, 
verses nine and 10, Paul quotes, and that's what we, we were looking at. Paul quotes uh, 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 the Psalms and, and he alludes to the prophet Isaiah to support this argument about the given. He goes all the way back to the Old Testament to help support that. Someone has something to say. Did someone have something they wanted to say? It would be nice if I could see you. I can't see you. Okay. And, and, and so here's what, what, what he says. And, and so Keener, uh, uh, one of the one theologian, explained Paul's argument this way. He says in verse nine, Paul quotes um, Psalm 112.9, which in context refers to the generosity and the vindication of the righteous, having given to the poor, their righteousness endures. That, that, that's, that's what the verse helps us to understand. Yet God is a supreme benefactor on whom these generous benefactors also must depend. What does that mean? That, that means that in verses 9 and 10, here's what he says. And, and, and we'll put that in perspective. He says, as the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. That's, that's what he wants us to understand. And so, and so now Paul recalls what I just read in verse, in verse uh, 10. Uh, what what Isaiah said in chapter 55, which speaks of God as the one who gives seed and the sore to the sore and bread for food to those who give. And, and so as, as they keep giving, God would keep multiplying their seeds so that they could give more and multiply their harvest of righteousness. So, so the more you give, the more God gives back to you so that you can continue to give even more. And, and, and what that does, as, as the scripture says, it, it produces a greater harvest of generosity in you. The more God gives you, the more you should give. That, that, that's what that essentially is saying. That's what that essentially is saying. Questions or comments. And so the storehouse of all good things belongs to God. Brother Simon. Uh, yes, Reverend Melanda, this may not sound very spiritual, but... I, in reality, I think a lot of people are just kind of ignorant on the the cost of things. Okay. You know, um, oftentimes we think church, we're thinking, oh, money is going directly to paying clergy only, you know, but when we think about, sometimes we don't think about the uh, outreach to the community, you know, the, the different people we we feed. You know, the, the the bills that have to be paid and we want a nice facility to to go and worship in. And, you know, oftentimes people don't think about those those things. Uh, I think about when uh, you take my family, we had a family reunion. Everybody wanted a nice family reunion and we got a list of what everybody wanted to, you know, what experience. And then we say, OK, well, to have that experience, it'll cost each of us this amount of money. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, people weren't so outspoken or if, in fact, they didn't give their money, but they wanted this nice stuff, you know. And I think sometimes we uh, in within the church and, and I think Paul is talking to the, 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 the church, not just, you know, casual people. Right. Uh, I think it's the same thing because I, I was thinking back to one of our meetings where it was it was eye opening that it was a very small percentage of the people paying the most money to make sure that things get paid for, you know, and uh, that was to me, that's, that spoke volumes about how we may see or, or may not see uh, things that need to get taken care of. And that's all I have. Great. Uh, 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 that was a good segue. And you're right. Uh, I don't, you know, many times we think because God is God, that God does not need us to participate in ministry, that, that he'll just take care of it uh, without us uh, uh, being, uh, being involved. But, but, but the bottom line is, is that God has called you and I to participate in ministry and giving is one of the ways that we participate. 
I, I think because, I, and I don't know whether this is teaching or, or whether it's just uh, or, or, or tradition that we've brought over that things will take care of themselves, just like you said with the family reunion. We want all these wonderful things uh, until we figure out, until we learn that they cost money. And, 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 and historically, let me say this, the church has been supported by 20% of, of, of those who are members of the church. The other 80%, for the most part, just come. And, 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 or however that works. And, and so there are, there has been and continues to be a small number of people who actually trust God to the point that they're willing to be engaged financially in ministry. And, and that's the hard part of pastoring is that we make all these grandiose plans and we put them in place and we start to execute them. And then the people who said they would support it don't support it. Yet, yet we're in this, we're in this place and in this phase where, you know, we've got to move forward. We've got to do something with it. But when we get to, and I love how Paul does this. He's not badgering the people. He's trying to get them to understand that if you trust God, God will provide for you. you. You don't have, God is not a man that he should lie. And scripture tells us, and if you step back through your own life, and this is me, I, I've done this, especially since I've been doing uh, this series here in, in, in Corinthians and, and listening to Paul and listening to the spirit and, and listening to God as he speaks to me, I have changed the way I give. Because now I recognize that, that everything I have, come on somebody, comes from the Lord. I recognize that had it not been for the Lord, these things I would not have. Because I would have messed it up by now. Oh yeah, I had to, and here's the thing you have to remember, God is not writing checks from heaven. You're going to have to engage somewhere, get a job and work. But if you trust God, he'll take you to the place where he'll put you in a position where you can make what he needs for you to make in order to be a part of what he's doing for kingdom building. It, part of our issue in every situation that relates to God is our ability and willingness to trust him. So, so I, I totally agree and, and when we can get to a point where we're willing to let those things go and to trust God to, to do what he said he's going to do, I, 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 can, I can say from my own life, when I look back over, oh, there's no way that some of these things could have happened had it not been for the Lord. He opened some doors and he closed some doors. He paid for some stuff and he made, and he let some stuff go. I, and what I found out later was I didn't need that anyway. It was not going to profit me or prosper me in any way. As a matter of fact, it would have taken me back to some other place that I didn't need to go. I didn't know that, but God did. And so I've learned how to trust him in a way I had not done before. And I'm telling you from my own experience, God will take care of you. And so, and so in our lesson, the storehouse of all good things belongs to God. Look, look what he says in James, in James, and, and we quote this all the time, every good and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, everything you have comes from God. It comes from him and, and, and in him, that there is no change. There's no turning from where he is and what he's doing in your life to some other shadow or dark place that you've been. God is not that kind of God. And so everything, God has a storehouse in heaven that he has put every good and perfect thing in. And he opens up that door and he provides for you and I. 
from his infinite source of blessings, God can replenish all the seed we sow. That's what we have to remember, whether it's material or spiritual, whether it's your money or your prayers for somebody, whether it's your time or your talent to do some things that'll make a difference in the body of Christ. Whatever it is, God can replenish it. Will he? Will you let him? You know, we got to give God something to bless. Sometimes God don't have nothing to bless because we have not invested anything in what God has called us to do in order for him to move in a way that would multiply or replenish or give back to us what we've sown. We, we, we've got to get, we got to engage in God in order for God to engage in us. We've got to. And so these lessons that Paul has brought us to in, in this in this four series lesson on sacrificial ministry, the self-sacrificial ministry, as we talk about giving from a biblical perspective back to the ministries of God. As, as we come through all of this, we have to know that God will bless, but we got to give him something to bless. We got to give him something to bless. And so God not only supplies the seed, he also multiplies it. Remember that. For God is the one who provides a seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. And in the same way, he will provide an increase and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Not only is God the source of the supplier of the seed. He's the one that gives the increase. God is the one that gives the increase. And so the ultimate purpose of God's liberal provision to his people is to produce thanksgiving to himself. Hmm, hadn't thought about that. Everything returns to God's glory, that he would be praised and thanked for his bountiful blessing. That's what verse 11 helps us. It helps us to see, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gift to those who are in need, they will give thanks to God. How many times have you said, thank you, God, for something somebody else gave you? Oh, you say thank you to them, but then you look up because you know God is a source of what you've received to meet your need. And so Swindoll encourages us to think about the last time we received a, a surprising blessing from the Lord. That's what I was just talking about. Uh, your need was great, but nobody knew except you and the Lord. You waited on God patiently, surrendered to his provision and to his timing. And that's the thing that we have a hard time doing. You know, God is not, uh, uh, sometimes God can be so slow, okay? And so we many times we have a hard time waiting for God and surrendering our will to him, his will. And we're waiting for him to provide, but we're doing it based on his timing. And sometimes we want what we want when we want it and we want it now. And God isn't always there. Why? Sometimes because we're not ready. Sometimes because we can't handle it. And sometimes it's because it's not what you need. God knows best. If God knows just what we need, he's not going to give us what we ask for if he knows that's not what we need. And so we have to remember God's provision and God's timing is based on his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience. It's based on he knows all things. It's based on that, that, that he sees all things. And, and so we have to remember sometimes when we don't get what we're asking God for, it's not because God does not want to give and, and because God is not going to give. It's because God knows that, that, that that's not something that's going to bless you. 
Yeah, everything we ask for is not something that will bless us. Many times we're asking for what we want and not necessarily what we need. Okay. God said, I will supply your need. That, that implies to me that you don't always have to just run and say, I need this. God knows. If he says he's going to supply, then he has to know what he needs to supply. And I truly believe that he does that, that he knows what you need and he makes a way for that in spite of you. Whether you pray or not. Whether you know or not. Whether you understand that he's made a way or not, it's God at work in you and others around you to meet your need. And, and so then God miraculously, miraculously provides through a surprising source. You never expected it, yet there it is. Remember your response? When God provided what you never expected him to provide, when, when you didn't tell him you needed it, when you didn't tell anybody else you needed it, somebody just walked up and gave you the money. Hey, baby, um, God told me to give you this. I don't know why. God bless you. And you shake your head. Oh, my God. Oh, how I thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Nobody knew, but you did. I've had those moments in my life when nobody but God knew my pain. Nobody but God knew my need. And somebody just gave me what I needed. And, and so that's the kind of praise the Lord always deserves from us in response to his ministry of grace. That's the kind of praise. Thank you, God. You've done marvelous things. You've done for me what nothing else and nobody else could or would have done without your grace, without your intervention. And, and so the people in Jerusalem were desperate. They were cut off from the rest of the world. They had no ability of themselves and no hope of relief from others. They were in Jerusalem and the other churches were out in, 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 in Greece and, 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 and other places in Corinth and, and Macedonia and Ephesus and those places. And they were not in close proximity to one another. It wasn't like they could have a rally and everybody meet in the park. You know, it wasn't like First Mount Zion and Ebenezer and Dale City and 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 and, and Little Union. What all of us went in the same block. And so they were in a desperate situation, cut off from from all of the other churches. They're, they're in Jerusalem. And, and, and because of what had happened in that they, they'd accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior, uh, their families had cut them off. They couldn't get jobs. They were losing their homes and didn't have food for their families. And they were in dire need with no hope. And so they turned their attention to God and God alone. The one who could do miracles. The first century church is not unlike our churches today. We need God. God and God alone is where we should turn our attention in every situation that we might be able to tap into the riches of God. That he would open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. And then one day, a delegation arrived, a small group sent by Paul, representing all the churches and hundreds of Gentile Christians, unknown to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. These people had never met. They, 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 they hadn't text messaged each other. There were no emails going out. Uh, they, they weren't able to call each other on the phone. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were no televisions. Uh, NBC was not broadcasting their need and, and MSNBC was not commentating what was going on. None of that was going on. It took weeks and months and days 
to get from one place to another place. But just, come on somebody, in the nick of time, God sent into their midst the very thing that they need. And so this small delegation laid before the elders of the Jerusalem church a large amount of money, enough to purchase food and to supply relief for months to come. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how they might have felt? What they might be thinking? God is real. That's the thought. We, we sing that song, yes, my God is real. But have we really felt him in our souls? Has that real feeling permeated from us to open up our hearts to trust God in the real circumstances and situations of life? Where are we? And so what a demonstration of God's amazing provisions when we don't know where the next meal is going to come from. God put food on the table. When we don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage, God sends money to pay the mortgage. It was a testimony to the scoffing uh, Pharisees of the wonder-working love amongst those who comprise the Christian church, that such a gift would come from the very people that these Pharisees consider to be unclean Gentiles. An enormous monetary gift that supplied the needs. And when we say the church, we're not talking just about the, the, the priest and, 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 and all of the leaders in the church. We're talking about the community and all of the members that made up the church. They were all in this together and all of them were in dire straits. And they had a need that God met through the generosity of the body of Christ. Of the body of Christ. And, and, and so as they went forward in these last few verses, Paul helps us to understand a little bit more as we look at how God orchestrated this thing through, 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 through the blessing of the churches uh, uh, in the body of Christ. For the, for the administration of this service, not only supply the needs of the saints, okay, but also is abounded through many thanksgivings to God, okay? Not only did, did the pulling together, the administration, the gathering of this information, the gathering of this money, the gathering of these people, uh, the, the service, not only did it supply the needs of the saints at Jerusalem, but this enormous gift that blessed the church in Jerusalem also abounded through many thanksgivings to God. It also caused people to give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, to God our Father. And while through the proof of this ministry, they glorified God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, come on, and for your liberal sharing with them and all men, and by their prayer for you, you long for, who, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. And then he goes on to say, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, okay? So, so he comes back, Paul comes back and says, look, th th this, this, this money that you've collected, th 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 this money, not only is it gonna bless them, he's talking to the Corinthians, not only is the money gonna bless the saints in Jerusalem, but it's also going to be a, 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 an opportunity for for God to be praised and to be lifted up for who he is and what he's done. It's going to provide for him just an understanding of how much these people love him. And, 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 it's, and, and it's going to prove that you, church, that you are obedient. That in your obedience, you glorified God because you confessed the Lord Jesus Christ and you shared liberally with all those who had a need. 
you, 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 didn't, you didn't try to segregate people and, and move around. What you did was you came with the gifts and you generously gave into the need that we brought before you. And so the prayers of those people for you become exceeding. They're going to pray much for you. Much for you. And then he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. For his indescribable gift. And so this bountiful gift would bring a joyful response from the recipients. So Paul encourages the Corinthian church to give by helping them to see that giving evokes a reciprocal blessing. And that's what we need to, I think that's where we kind of don't quite see how the ministry of giving blesses. Our giving to help meet the needs of others always evokes a reciprocal blessing in, in that many times as we give, people start to pray for us. Thank you for those people, God. Th thank you for using them to meet my need. And then thank you, Lord, for what you've done through them. Give them all that they stand in need of, God, that, that they might be ready and available and willing to support others who have a need. And then bless us, God, that we might be able to be a part of those who bless others who have a need, just like you blessed me. Help me to be a blessing to somebody else. But those are some of the prayers that these saints in Jerusalem must have prayed as they watched what God had done through the ministry of giving from the other churches in the body of Christ. And, and so those who gave joyously and graciously, seeking no credit for themselves, glorify God. Their giving was, 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 was to glorify God. They gave because of what God had already given them. That's us. That's us. We give because of what God has already given. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Jesus Christ. You're obedient. And so the results of what they did and how that, how that was handled was the entire process flows heaven floods heaven with a high tide of praise that surged at the feet of the Lord Jesus. They blessed you. Notice that everybody involved is blessed. And that's the reciprocal blessing of our giving. Everybody that, that is involved in this blessing or in this, in this administration of the gift is blessed. First, the giver is blessed by the joy inherent in giving and by the promise of reward from the hand of God. Jesus himself said this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes we have to step back and listen a little bit closer to what Jesus himself says. One reason is because those who give receive the benefit of the prayers of the recipients on their behalf. Th those who receive, and I can say this from my own, when I receive something from somebody, it always evokes in me, invokes in me prayer. I always thank God for that person. And for the fact that that person gave me something, even if it's a little thing of candy, thank you, Lord, a little plaque or certificate, just the little things that, that we don't always think about thanking God for. Any act of kind, people don't have to be kind to you now. 
any act of kindness or generosity that is bestowed upon you by somebody in the body of Christ that God has moved to acknowledge you. Give thanks. You will be amazed at what that does. Not just for you, but for the person who is the giver. Give thanks. We don't have to wait for the big things to give thanks. The little things, those are the things that God is looking at. Remember the, 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 the parable at the very beginning with the woman with the alabaster uh, uh, box as she came and, 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 and she, and she cried and, and she, and she washed Jesus feet with her, with her tears and, and she wiped them with her hair and she anointed his feet with oil. And, and, and how, how, how big was that? We couldn't see the enormity in it. To us, it just looked like a small thing. But to God, to Jesus, it, 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 it was a, a blessing, a giving of herself. And, and in that parable, he comes back and tells Simon, well, when I came in here, you didn't, you didn't give me the water to wash my feet. You, you didn't anoint my head with oil. You, you, you didn't give me anything. And, and, and this woman, come on, somebody, has not since I've been here stopped acknowledging my goodness toward her. And then he, you know, your sins are forgiven. That's what he told her in the parable. And, and so as we as we bring those things in, in into our own lives, as we think about how those how those principles work, we can see what happens. And, and I love the fact that that one reason is because those who give receive the benefit of the prayers of the recipients on their behalf. We don't we don't always come on. We don't always look at the prayers of others as benefits, spiritual benefits to us from God. So there comes a time when you, when you have to step back and put everything in perspective as it relates to your relationship with God. When we do that, what we're able to do is we're able to see everything. Come on. The prayers of the righteous as coming from God. God, you motivated them to pray for me. God, God, thank you, Lord, for the little, for, for, for the piece of, of bread. Thank you, God, for the cake. Thank you, God, for the chocolates. Thank you, God, for the card. Just watch what that does for your spirit. When you see God at work in every situation and give him thanks. Not just for meeting your need, but for the source that he used to supply it. Thank God for one another. When you pray, thank you God for the church. Every individual. Thank you for the body of Christ. Every person, thank you. So this is what thanksgiving and ministry through giving looks like as we put it on paper and we start to work it out. And so secondly, first, first it was uh, those who give, okay? They, they, they're the first ones uh, who, who are blessed. Look at this. Second, the recipient of the gift, the recipients of the gift are also blessed. They receive a solution for their problems and relief for their affliction. Thank you, Lord. Third, God is also blessed as the recipients overflow through many thanksgivings to God, which we see in verse 12, they glorify God because of the giver's obedience and attribute to God ultimate responsibility for the blessing. 
I do that all the time. Every time I get something, I know it's God. I thank God for the giver. I thank God for the source that he uses to bless me. But ultimately, come on, somebody. I thank God for his grace and for his mercy, for his bountiful blessings that continue to sustain life and liberty for me. I've learned how to do that. Oh, I have not always been there. But God has spoken some things that helped me to put it in perspective. And so glorify God because of the giver. That's, God is also blessed. God is also blessed. And so Paul closes, look at this, with this sudden burst of gratitude to God for his grace. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. I, I can't put in words, Lord, the blessing of this gift. Oh, I can say it's lots of money. You know, I, I, I can say it, it, it's a new car. I can say it's a new house. I can say it's a, a, a new dress. I can say all of those things, but I can't describe the grace that brought me this gift. I can't describe. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I, I have no words. That, that, that I can use that would put into perspective, come on, God, what you've done in this gift. I can't do that. I, I, don't, I don't have anything within my finite understanding of who you are that can put into words the magnitude of this gift. Whether it's a slice of bread or a million dollars. God is in it all. And, and so the perfect picture of God's grace is Jesus Christ hanging on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. That's the picture of this grace giving, of this self-sacrificial giving of this ministry through giving. That's the picture. Christ hanging on this old rugged cross. It puts the ministry through giving into perspective. When we picture Christ. Can, can you turn away from this picture of love? This picture of giving? The picture of amazing self-sacrificial grace? Can you just turn away? Can you look at the cross and not be changed? Not be compelled to give yourself to him, to Christ. Not be compelled to give to others in the same way that God has given to you. Can you actually look at what God did in Christ on Calvary and not impact your life in some way? All of us saw the passion of the Christ. And some of us saw it twice or three times. And it, it, it invoked in us some things that we did not know we had in us. And so we got this vivid picture now from some of the things that we've seen of the sacrifice the cross required for our salvation. And so can, can we actually look at the cross and not be changed? That, that's what Swindoll wants to leave us with here or, or make sure we understand as we finish these last three verses, four verses. That's what he wants us to know. And so by way of application, when we talk about this ministry through giving, what, what is the outcome of a ministry through giving? From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's a new covenant kind of giving. 
that starts in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. As we look at God's economy and how he plans to finance his economy. And so in closing, Swindoll reminds us that stewardship is a key principle in scripture. And while we may not always see that word a lot, what, what we are able to do is to understand that stewardship means the management of everything that God has placed in our hands. Stewardship of our time, our gifts, our abilities, and yes, our money. Stewardship. And so the Old Testament prescribes very specific regulations for giving tithes and offerings. And you see them there in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and back in uh, Malachi. And in the New Testament, Jesus frequently talks about wealth and riches and money and stewardship. And you'll find that in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all have some rendition of the same kind of information that Jesus is sharing about money and giving and wealth and our stewardship and riches. All of them speak to that in some fashion. And so the New Testament is the fulfillment of the law. And the tithe or the mandatory 10% predates the law. That's what we have to remember when we start looking at the tithe and we start looking at the New Testament and, and, and seeing how God has put those together. So it predates the law and it celebrates the faith of Abraham in giving to God. That's what it does. So the New Testament addresses the issue of generous giving, generous financial contributions, and the stewardship of all of our possessions. So the New Testament does that. We, we see the law came in and talked about the tithe. The New Testament comes in and now says, okay, let's talk about giving generously. Yes, the tithe is there. It's the floor. It's the ceiling. But what about generous giving? What about our generosity in, in our financial giving? And so based on God's blessings to us, there are four passages in the New Testament, all in Paul's letters to the Corinthians, that we should consider as we plan our giving. Each of these passages focus on a different element of giving, okay? And the first one we, we find in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that talks about the justification for our giving. And, and, here's, and here's what it says. And the second one, well, I'm not going in there. The second one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It talks about instructions for giving. The third one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And it talks about uh, illustrations of giving. And then the fourth one is in chapter 9, which we're in now. And it talks about the application of giving, things that we've just finished discussing. And so in number one, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 11 through 18, justification for giving, it, it talks here about ministers and, and what they do. And so, and what it says is those ministers who sow spiritual things through their preaching and their teaching have a right to receive material support from those to whom they minister. Now, Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth to let them know that, uh, that, that he does have, uh, based on his, 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 his teachings and based on what God has spoken into his spirit, that, 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 that they should be willing to materially support him in verse, uh, verse nine, chapter nine, verse 11. Okay. Uh, for, for fair remuneration is explicitly described and encouraged in scripture. As we look at uh, second Timothy, it talks about, uh, those who are, our, our ministers, it, it says that let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so this very justification says that the laborer is wor worthy of his labor. Back to what we were talking about a little earlier when we were talking about whether or not we should pay the, 
the ministers and the preachers and those who are in, who labor in the church. Yes, the scripture says that we should, okay? And so 2 Timothy helps us to understand that. And, and, and although Paul chose not to receive money for his spiritual labor, it was his own decision. It, it wasn't something that somebody told him or, or wanted him to do. It was not a required principle for others. And you'll see that written in, in 1 Corinthians and, and, and the book of Acts as we go back and start to look at Paul's journey, because in Acts, we even see Paul's journeys as he's going through these different uh, 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 pilgrims, pilgrimages back and forth and establishing the churches, okay? And number two is 2 Corinthians 16, one and two. That's instructions for giving instructions for giving. What does it say? It says that 2 Corinthians uh, first chapter, Corinthians. Say first, Corinthians. First, first Corinthians 16 and, and 1, uh, 16 says 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day now, this is the instructions for giving. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. Okay? So, so for all who are wondering about the proper procedures, then, then these verses will supply for us this checklist that we need. Notice here that, that you don't see in these verses any pressure, that there's nothing announced there's no public attention drawn to this and no manipulation. So giving should be, and here's what it should be. It should be systematic. That's what it says on the first day of the week. Remember, we just read that. So it should be something that is systematic. We should have a time and a method and, and a prescribed way that we're going to do this. That's what it says. Individually, what that means is everybody, each one of us, individually must be involved in the giving of to the church consistently we need to put it aside and save it we need to make sure that what we're doing is we're making provisions or we're making room or we're setting aside something that we're going to give to the ministries uh, of the gospel of jesus christ it should be proportionately as he may prosper based on how God blesses you. You give based on those things and it should be privately, not collected, uh, uh, but made. No collection be made when I come. And so Paul is saying to them, he, here's the instructions for giving. They must be systematic. They must be individual. They must be consistent. They must be proportionate. And it is private. It's a matter between you and God. It's what you purposed in your heart to do for God. And because you purposed in your heart to do that for God, then it's private. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to bring your W-2. Come on, somebody. You don't have to bring uh, your checkbook or your bank statement. None of that needs to be brought to the church to prove that you're given based on how God has blessed you. This is a trust issue. God trusts you to do what you say you're going to do. He, he, he don't need for you to confirm it. He trusts you to do it. And so number three, number three is 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 9. And we've that was one of our lessons that we studied and we're not going to read those scriptures. Uh, it, it is illustrations of giving. Paul gives us two illustrations that we talked about just the last time we met uh, for a proper giving. The Macedonian churches uh, in verses one through uh, three and Jesus in verse nine. So those were the illustrations of what proper giving would look like. In these verses, we see that giving should be done with great generosity. Remember, the, the, the Macedonians' churches wanted to give out of their own need, out of their own poverty. They asked Paul to take their money as an overflow of our devotion to the Lord. That, that's what they did because they loved God and they knew the need and they believed that, come on, somebody, that God would provide for them in spite of what was going on. So if I give out of my poverty, I know God is going to replace that 
God's going to make sure that I have bread on my table and that I have a roof over my head and, and that I'm in good health and moving forward. And so they wanted to give. They asked Paul to allow them to give, even out of their own poverty. Uh, and, and, and so that overflow of, of, of their devotion and their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus gave up everything for our sake, becoming poor so that we might become spiritually rich, we too should give self-sacrificially to the ministries that God has called us to do. Now, let me say this. God provides for you and he takes care of your needs. He does not call us to give what we don't have. I'm going to say that again. God provides for you to meet your needs and he will never call you to give what you don't have. So, so, so when he provides for your needs, take care of your needs. That's all I'm saying. Take care of your needs. Now, if it's all because you have mismanaged everything and, and, and you're in a pickle because all your credit card bills are, 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 are overdue because you're out spending and thrifting and doing all these other kind of things, then you might want to go back to God and, and, and kind of have a little chat. But God never calls us to give what we don't have. the illustrations of giving. Number four comes out of chapter nine, the chapter that we're finishing up now, application of giving. And so like the rest of, the, of, of our Christian lives, giving is not to be done out of oppressive obedience to rules and regulations. That's why the scripture says God loves a cheerful giver in response to guilt trips or because of peer pressure. God wants us to give because we love him. Because he's provided for us, because we recognize him as the source of everything that we have. And and we recognize that he's overflowed into our coffers. And, and because he's done that, what we can do is be generous with what he's given us. That is an overflow of what we need. That's what he wants us to do. So, 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 so giving is not to be done out of oppressive obedience to rules and regulations. We, we don't want to do that. You know, uh, you, I don't have your tithe check. I don't have this in response to some guilt trip. Or you, you should have done this. Or because of peer pressure. Well, you know, so-and-so gave that. And so giving should be from the heart. That's what I want you to remember. Out of everything we've talked about tonight, and then I've run my mouth a little bit, but out of everything that we've discussed tonight, the, the takeaway is that giving should be from the heart. Ideally, giving should be done with a free and willing attitude from the heart. A person should not be reluctant to give, nor regret giving, but rather be eager to give and to receive the joy that abounds from their stewardship through giving. New covenant giving. It ought to be from the heart. And so, and so God, Lord, help us to strengthen the body of Christ and to bring glory to you by understanding and practicing the principles that we have discussed and that have been taught in these passages that we've gone over tonight. Thank you for your great love and care for us and for the grace and mercy that abounds to us from your generous giving. As we continue, Lord God, to trust you with everything, knowing that all things work together for good when we love you, when we love you, and we trust you to meet our every need according to your riches and glory. 
not according to our circumstances or our lack of understanding. In Jesus' name. And so tonight, we're going to finish up this section on the sacrifice, the self-sacrificial ministries with this ministry through giving. We're going to come back on next week on Wednesday night, and we're going to start a brand new section, the last section in our study of first of second of uh, Pauline epistles of these Corinthian books. We're going to come back next week and we're going to talk about the defense of Paul's ministry in chapter 10. We're going to start a new section called the true apostolic ministry. And so we're going to get a peek into Paul's ministry and the challenges that he faced as he sought in the first century to minister and build the Church of Jesus Christ. Are there any questions? Comments? I'm going to stop sharing. I am going to... Okay.